The issue of the prisoners of war brings up the very, very controversial issue of slavery in early Islam and in Islamic law. And this is a very hot topic that obviously uh, critics of Islam uh, and even Muslims that don't know the Sharia that well, they always bring questions. One of the questions I always get asked uh, about from our, uh, you know, our young men and women is, what does our religion say about this? How do we read these books of uh, the Seerah? of the Quran even, uh, which mentions Malakat Aymanukum, the, the right hand possessions. What do we say about all of these things? Now, uh, this is a very long topic in and of itself, and it is a very controversial topic. Uh, and the first thing is I don't like using the term slavery because the English term slavery comes with a connotation in West Western history that the Arabic term and Islamic terms never had. The very term slavery is historically loaded. And when we use the term instantaneously, we get images of Hollywood movies and whatnot of American slavery, which was honestly, historically speaking, one of the worst manifestations of this institution in human history. Even the ancient Romans treated their slaves better than uh, what we saw in this land 200 years ago. And this is a historic fact which everybody acknowledges, that the way slavery existed, especially in this country, was really the worst manifestation of that institution in human history. So when we use the term slavery, automatically that type of image and scenario comes up, whereas that never existed ever in the history of Islam, even in the history of many other cultures, that version did not exist. So I don't mean like I don't even like using the English term. Rather, we can use ubudiya or riq or something of this nature, which is the Arabic connotation. Now, uh, we need to look at the issue of riq from two angles. Firstly, within the context of their times and what did Islam do? And then secondly, within the context of our social, political, ethical, the, uh, ethical uh, laws and, and um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the banning of the institution of slavery in the modern world. So firstly, within the context of their times. Within the context of their times, we need to understand that slavery or riq or ubudiyya was a universal practice. No culture or society had banned it ever in that period. In the, uh, in the Middle Ages, early, uh, in the uh, pre, um, uh, in the Roman societies, Greek societies, Chinese societies, Indian societies, it was rampant around the whole globe. And Islam was the only and the first to institute laws for ubudiyya. There were no laws for ubudiyya, for riq, before the coming of Islam. And Islam was the only civilization to come and give a set of laws about dealing with uh, riq. And of those laws were to limit, the, to have checks and balances put into place by number one, restricting where do abs come from. And Islam restricted it to one and only one source. Prisoners of war who are not ransomed. Every civilization in the world allowed abs to be basically captured in other lands who were free and then capture them as a free man and then sell them as what happened over here. You just go into a land and you just take somebody, force him into riq and then uh, bring him as, a, uh, as an abd, as a prisoner, as a, as a slave. Whereas in Islam there was only one source, a legitimate war that is fought and a state fights another state. You have these five, ten thousand prisoners and there's no ransom to be paid. Nobody's paying their ransom. What is to be done? You cannot just set them free, they're going to come back to you, right? What is to be done? You take them as, as abd, as uh, in the institution of riq. So that's the only source of getting riq in Islam. The second uh, law that was done is to legislate proper treatment, which again was unheard of in any other civilization and culture. There are numerous ahadith about treating abs, treating amas in a humane manner, about Ex quite literally, hadith in Bukhari says that your slaves are your brothers. Ikhwanukum khawalakum. Right? They are your brothers. Feed them from what you eat and give them, uh, uh, and give them to wear from what you wear. And that is why in Islam there are many instances of you can't tell the riq from the master. You cannot tell that. And in Islam, uh, leads, leads me to the third point as well. And that is that Islam legislated the freeing of slaves through multiple avenues. So many penalties, a false oath or testimony, breaking your uh, fast in Ramadan, so many things. What is the penalty in the Quran? 
تحرير رقبة free slave. In fact, it legislated zakat money, one of the eight categories of zakat, وفي الرقاب. Imagine the highest institution of money, which is zakat. One of the eight is freeing a slave. That's not something to be taken lightly. So Allah Azza wa Jal said, you can use your zakat for freeing a, a slave. And in fact, not just zakat and penalty, it is one of the highest virtues of Islam. There are chapters, even in the book we are reading on a daily basis, which is Imam al-Nawiz Riyadh al-Salihin, there are chapters, the virtue of freeing a riq or an amma. There are chapters that you are told that one of the ways to free yourself from Jahannam is to free a slave. And that's why Aish and others, they would be hunting for riq to free. So it's a virtue in our religion to actually free an abd or an amma. And fifthly, we can say that of the uh, interesting things of our law is that it created a legal framework that incorporates treatment of riqs and ammas, but it doesn't require their existence. So if we eliminate the whole institution of abs and ammas, the Islamic Sharia is still valid and intact. There is no legislation that requires an, an abd. Don't, there's no legislation that requires the existence of this institution. And therefore, in our times, when there is no such institution as slavery, Islamic law is full and valid. And it doesn't need their existence. And this is an amazing point in my opinion that clearly demonstrates that Allah Azza wa Jal uh, intended for this institution to be something that is not necessary and required. If it's there, there are laws that governed it for 11, 12 centuries. Now that it's gone, we don't need it. Those institutions don't need to be brought back. And that's why I don't know of any scholar in our times that is calling for uh, this institution to come back. So. Looking at now, of course, there's also the issue of uh, having conjugal relations with uh, the Amas or the female slaves. And this is obviously, as usual, a very sensitive topic that many people find problematic, Muslims and non-Muslims. But once again, all societies and cultures had the exact same rule. It's not something that Islam came with. It's not something that Islam was new about. Every society and culture had the same rule. In fact, there's plenty of references in the Old and New Testament. And are we forgetting our own father, Ibrahim alayhi salam, what was Hajar and uh, uh, the lineage of the process goes back to Hajar. This is something that even the Old Testament and the New Testament uh, talk about. But previous civilizations and cultures, they did not have any rules. And in many cultures, including pre-Islamic Arabian culture, your Amma couldn't, didn't just have to be yours. You could lend her to other people, astaghfirullah. And of course, what happened was you would then hire her out to other people. And this was the common practice. That your Amma, you would hire her out for a night. You understand what I'm saying here? And the Quran references this fact, that this is haram. The Quran references it, you cannot do this. So the Quran came and legislated things even in this regard. That if you have such an Amma, then she must be only yours. And children born in Jahiliyyah days were considered to be sometimes slaves. Whereas in Islam, the child born from such a union will always be exactly 100% the same as a child from a marriage. And that's why Ismail and Ishaq are both equal in the eyes of the Sharia of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ismail and Ishaq are both equal. And in fact, if you look at our own history, the majority of the Khulafa were born of slaves. The majority. And that's a huge thing to say. And go back and check it. The majority of the Abbasids and the Uthmanids, the majority of the Abbasids and the Uthmaniyun were actually children of slaves. And what does that indicate? That their lineage that from the mother's side was not something that brought a stigma to them. It was something that brought no stigma to them. And also, if a child was born of such a union, immediately the Amma was upgraded. A free upgrade is given to her. She is no longer an Amma. She is called Ummul Walad. This is the books of fiqh have a chapter called the chapter of Ummul Walad. What is Ummul Walad? Ummul Walad is a special category of Amma. In that, you cannot, after this child is born, sell her to anybody else. She's only yours. Because now that she's a mother of a child, that's Ummul Walad, the mother of the child. She's no longer treated like anyone else. She becomes Ummul Walad and she cannot be. Uh, transferred ownership or sold or or, 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 or or anything of this nature and she becomes free on the death of the child's father. 
So as soon as the child's father dies, then she becomes automatically, with his death, she becomes free. Now that's a very interesting law that did not exist in any other civilization and culture. The point being that, yes, I understand this is a, a difficult topic for many of us, especially our our young minds to, to grasp and the fact of the matter is we don't have to deal with this in the modern world. Allah Azza wa Jal legislated something that for the time and the context was the most humane possible and everything seemed to work towards eliminating this institution. Now that it is eliminated, Alhamdulillah, we don't have to call for it to be brought back or whatnot. It is now gone from, uh, and by the way, uh, Riq was abolished in Muslim lands from 1870 onwards. So it was recent. Not like in Europe or whatnot. In in Muslim lands, you had uh, abs for uh, a little bit longer. And in the 1870s, 80s, 90s, and then 19, 10, 20, 30s, uh, there were abolition movements as they were in Europe as well. And there was opposition to them, just like there was in Europe as well. And many Muslim clerics opposed the opposition, right? Opposed the abolishment of riq. Because they said it is Islamic and some forward thinkers said, no, we're modern times, we don't need it. And so eventually, Alhamdulillah, as we know, it has all now been eliminated. At least we can say it doesn't exist in the form it used to. Some can say some of the workers that are in some countries, they're treated like slaves. That's just something else, right? But the, the, the institution of Abd or Ubudiyya, it is now gone. The bottom line, yes, Wallahi, it is a very difficult issue to wrap our minds around, uh, but it needs to be said and, and explained because we've talked about this so many times and this was the reality of the uh, situation throughout the world and our religion came and legislated it, made it far more uh, humane, if you like, than any other civilization. In fact, no other civilization had laws about these matters. And our Sharia, I've just summarized some of the laws. Obviously, every book of fiqh, by the way, every book of classical fiqh, there's a chapter on ahkam al riq ahkam al abd ahkam al amma There's chapters about this, and you can go and read about uh, those chapters uh, for historical value if you want to. In our times, as we know, it is now uh, gone. And nonetheless, even in the seerah of the Prophet, notice how many times were the the uh, slaves freed, and our Prophet himself never had a personal slave khadim. He never had a slave khadim that he would, yani, uh, every slave that he had as a servant or whatnot, he would free. And um, uh, a number of the slaves that he had, when he freed them, they at attached themselves with him. And they just volunteered their services to him, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Of course, there was Maria al qibtiya uh, and Maria al qibtiya uh, there is a difference of opinion about her Islam. Did she remain a copter? Did she accept Islam or not? Uh, and Maria al qibtiya was not a servant, as you know of the process. I said he did not have a slave servant. He did not have a servant that was a slave. As for Maria al qibtiya then there was there is an ikhtilaf. Did she accept Islam or not? And we'll get to her uh, later on. Uh, but in any case, he did not, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ever have a personal uh, slave servant of his own.